already know that proteins mostly have important structural functions in our body. They are key structural components of all of our tissues and organs. The most abundant protein in our body is collagen, the main ingredient of all our connective tissues, our skin, our tendons, our bone matrix. But once we use protein to build all these structures, they will not stay there forever. Tissues and organs in our body will wear and tear on a daily basis and need to be repaired. Some structural proteins we lose. We lose hair, skin fragments, we cut our nails, our intestine walls slough off, and so we need structural proteins not only to grow new tissues, but also to maintain them throughout all of our life. The proteins we need for this maintenance activity to replace and repair tissues is what we call protein turnover. Our protein turnover is actually quite large, around 250 grams of proteins per day for the average adult. But luckily, most of the amino acids are recycled, and so our protein requirement from diet is way less than 250 grams because our protein need for turnover is largely covered by recycling of amino acids from broken down proteins. And then we know we need protein not only to build and maintain the structures in our body, but also to make all of these structures work. Virtually every metabolic pathway in our body involves protein, and we need several thousands of them so that we can function properly. This is the regulatory function of proteins. We need enzymes to digest and metabolize nutrients, to excrete waste products, to neutralize toxic substances, contaminants, pollutants, drugs, to fight off infections, to contract our muscle, to read our DNA and execute its instructions, to see, hear, taste and smell, and many, many more. Many hormones are proteins. The antibodies of our immune system are proteins, signaling molecules, transporters and carriers, receptors, storage molecules, antioxidant molecules, blood clotting factors, second messengers that carry messages inside the cells from the membranes to the nucleus or other organelles, or from the nucleus to the DNA. All these molecules are often proteins. Let's now focus on a couple of important regulatory functions of proteins. One is fluid balance. A lot of proteins, and especially the most abundant protein we have in our bloodstream, which is albumin, help maintain the appropriate distribution of water inside and outside our cells and our different tissues and organs. At the capillary beds, blood pressure forces fluids out of the blood vessels into the interstitial space so that they can exchange nutrients, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and waste products with our cells. But after the exchange is over, fluids have to go back inside our blood vessels to keep circulating. And this is accomplished by albumin. Albumin is too big to go through the capillary walls, and so it stays inside. This creates an osmotic pressure that will then suck fluids back from the interstitial space into the blood vessel. If we don't have enough albumin, fluids will start building up in the interstitial space, which is what we call edema. And this usually happens first in the lower extremities, because gravity doesn't help. Edema has many possible causes, but one of them is just protein deficiency. You will simply don't have enough albumin in your bloodstream. Another cause that you can easily understand is high blood pressure, which pushes out of the capillaries more fluids that proteins can bring back in. Another important function of proteins is acid-base balance. Membrane proteins can act as channels that regulate what goes in and out of our cells. One of these regulated substances is hydrogen. And by deciding how much stays in and out, we are able to strictly maintain the pH of our blood and our cells in the narrow range that's required to sustain life. Also, in our bloodstream, there are proteins that can act as buffers. They block some hydrogen if there's too much, or release it if there's not enough. And by doing this, they can further fine-tune the pH of our blood. Proteins can also be used as an emergency source of glucose. This is not their ideal use, but sometimes it's inevitable, so that we can keep our blood glucose levels stable. Which is vital, because some of our organs, and in particular our brain, can only use glucose to fuel their activities and not fat.
We normally maintain our blood glucose by eating carbs. We also have some glycogen stores, but it's not much. And so if we fast for many hours or go on a very low calorie or a very low carb diet, we deplete our glycogen stores and then our only option is making glucose from proteins, since we cannot make glucose from fat. But remember, we don't have any storage of proteins either, so if they don't come from food, we'll have to go and steal these proteins from lean mass, resulting in muscle wasting. This is the reason why if you want to lose weight, you never just stop eating. Because then you would start destroying muscle and lean mass to maintain blood glucose stable. As we know, proteins can also be used for energy. They provide 5.8 calories per gram, although we need to spend about 2 of these calories to make them available for energy production, so that only about 4 calories per gram are left to fuel other activities. But our body doesn't really like to use proteins for energy. It's kind of a waste because we have carbs and fats for energy, while protein can be used for much more important structural and regulatory functions. You wouldn't burn a precious wooden artifact in the fireplace, you'd use plain wood. But of course, if it's freezing cold and you're out of wood, you'd probably start considering burning your precious artifact. And your body does just that. So if you don't have enough glucose and fats, you'll use proteins for energy. There are mainly three situations where we will end up using protein for energy production. One is high protein, low fat and low carb diets. In this situation, you don't have enough carbs and fats for energy, but you have a lot of extra proteins beyond what you need for structural and regulatory purposes. So you'll just use those proteins for energy. This is not the worst case scenario because you're not stealing proteins from your lean mass, you're just eating extra. It's just a waste of proteins, but it's not harmful. If you're very rich, you can decide that in your fireplace you only want to burn ancient Chinese wooden artifacts instead of plain wood. You're not harming anybody, it's just probably not smart. A much worse scenario is if you just fast or go on a very low calorie diet. And now it's low fat, low carb, and low protein. So it's just low everything. You're not eating enough. And now you start to have to use proteins from your muscle to make some energy. You're not burning your wooden artifacts anymore. You're starting to take wood from the walls of your house to burn it in the fireplace. The third situation is prolonged anaerobic exercise, to the point that you have completely depleted your glycogen stores. If you're doing an anaerobic activity, you cannot use fats for energy, and so you'll have to turn to proteins. Branched chain amino acids are preferred by the muscle because they are easier to make energy from. If we have excess proteins and we do not need them from protein synthesis because we have enough, and we don't even need them for energy because we have enough carbs and fats. So now we are not exercising, we are just eating too much. We just have extra proteins we don't need. You remember that we cannot store proteins for later use. And so what we do at this point is we take these extra proteins and convert them to fat, which can then be stored into our adipose tissue. But this conversion is irreversible. So once we have turned proteins into fat, we have no way of turning fat back into proteins at the later time, because we lack the enzymes to do that. So once we have made fat from proteins, we have to either burn it as fat or keep it in our adipose tissue. Many people believe that eating proteins doesn't make you fat, but they are wrong. Any energetic nutrient, be it carbs, lipids, or proteins, when it is in excess of our energetic needs, is converted to fat and accumulated in our adipose tissue. These last three uses of proteins, which are making glucose, making fat, or using proteins for energy, are what we call protein catabolism, because we are sort of demolishing these proteins, breaking the amino acids down. But what we really need for protein catabolism is this part of the amino acid, the carbon skeleton. Remember, carbs and fats do not have nitrogen, so before we can use proteins to make energy or to make glucose or fats, we have to remove this nitrogen first. But the problem with that is that when you remove the amino group, you get ammonia, and free ammonia is highly toxic for our body, so it has to be immediately processed by our liver to make urea, which is still toxic but way less, and soluble enough 
so that it can take the bloodstream and quickly go to our kidneys that will excrete it with the urine. And so you see the liver and the kidneys have to do some work to catabolize protein and allow their use for energy. And for this reason, their thermogenesis is higher than the other nutrients. On top of that, protein catabolism will also increase water losses because to flush out this urea, we have to use water. This is one of the reasons why high-protein, low-carb diets make you quickly lose some weight, but that weight is mostly water. We have said that excess dietary proteins lead to protein catabolism. Actually, proteins can be converted to fat even if protein intake is not excessive, but if the amino acid quality is low. As you remember, if one essential amino acid is lacking, the rest becomes useless and it has to be disposed of. The same will happen if we have large excess of just one or a few amino acids, as it usually happens with individual amino acid supplements. These amino acids will likely be in excess of what's needed, and again, the rest has to be disposed of. 